Hi, everyone. My name is Sahan Delmagani. I'm the founder and CEO of Terra Cafe, and I beat the often path by opening myself up to as many experiences and possibilities as, as possible and ranging from, you know, living in China, trying to start a wind farm company, being the even the son of two architects, playing a role in letting my curiosity fly and chasing my passions. So excited to be here and, and uh, share that story with you all. Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. On this show, we celebrate unique and inspiring success stories to help us think outside the box in our lives and careers. Joining me today is Sahan Dilmagani, the founder and CEO of Terra Cafe, a coffee tech company that's raised over $14 million in funding so far. Sahan has a remarkable story that led him down the path of entrepreneurship, and his company is making more eco-friendly coffee and espresso machines that look and taste incredible. Now, Sahand made Forbes' next 1,000 in the consumer tech category, which is good for him, but bad for me, as I had to settle for 1,000 in first place, failing to make the cut yet again. Come on, Forbes! In seriousness, though, Terra Cafe estimates that they've prevented over a million coffee pods from becoming garbage, and in the words of the immortal Martha Stewart, that's a good thing. So here's Sahand Dilmagani of Terra Cafe. So why on earth coffee? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it was, it was one of those things where I, I think that you, you always, before you start anything, you should really kind of like look at that trifecta of like um, passion, competency, and opportunity before you really kick things off officially. And I would say on the passion side, I was definitely one of those outlier families. Like we had every coffee gadget under the sun to, you know, my mom was kicking back a turkish espresso coffee before i should should actually uh be careful there that's a bit of a misnomer but at least her turkish coffee before going to sleep at night and it was a big part of i i chalk it before up to that going kind of to like, sleep what's that before going to sleep before going to sleep it never made Not sense to me it still doesn't decaf. make sense to me but caffeinated uh, no, I, I think it's honestly it's like this kind of um weird thing where it's like Persian culture just circles around hot drinks. It's like coffee and tea are like the nucleus of our social circles. And so like from childhood, you're usually drinking tea and then you get introduced to coffee and it's such a big part of our lives. And it's a really endearing thing because, you know, it's kind of a, a way for like the family to come together and everyone in my family, we all had different drinks. So we, you know, for the longest time, the this photo of all these different coffee drinks in the background of my phone was actually each member of my family with a different drink that they would have as their go-to. So that's it was awesome. a big part of my life. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. So you have a lot of travel under your belt. What role did travel play in you coming up with this idea and your entrepreneurial spirits? You mentioned that you did some pretty crazy stuff. I did not know that you attempted to build a company in China. So maybe we can talk about any of that. Yeah, no, it was, uh, it's, it's, it, it's definitely one of those things that I am forever grateful to my parents for. They really imparted the importance of having that global mindset early on. I mean, you know, there's definitely a little bit of that, uh, kind of cliche global citizen language where it's like, you know, you just like to travel. But I think that one of the things I really appreciated was it was the travel with the intention of actually understanding the local culture, society, trying to really um, make that extra effort that was really critical in my personal development. I was traveling back and forth to China a lot, actually learning Chinese from a young age. So it was, okay. it was one of those things where I was studying probably, uh, I think, four different languages at the same time as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you can see I had to pause to remember the number there. So I had to make sure I'm getting that right. But yeah, that's um, my problem. I just can't remember how many languages I know. Yeah. Yeah. I always yeah, struggle. yeah, yeah. So, that's right. Eight, yeah. 15, who knows who can even keep track anymore. Um, it was, it, it was, I, as you could probably guess at the time, not super welcomed. Um, so it was one of those things that I think I didn't fully appreciate the value of it when I was doing it. So I actually, Got a, I get a lot of um, kind of like, you know, parents that are, you know, just having a newborn that are like, yeah, so like, how did you like it? Did you hate it? And I was like, honestly, like, I didn't love it, but I really appreciate it now. 
but it definitely adds a certain like lens or perspective into a society when you're going abroad you're building relationships it gives you a unique opportunity and so when i was growing up i mean we were traveling around a lot but you also just kind of like i think more subconsciously uh, act as a sponge without even realizing and you're just kind of getting hit with a lot of different ways of living and i think that that kind of is your springboard into creativity and curiosity. So it starts to kind of like plant the seeds that eventually blossom, right? Knowing with this, you know, mishmash of influences and travel and all of that, how did you begin to think that you could maybe influence coffee, which is such a saturated genre in general? Yeah, I mean, look, I think uh, it starts with a good dose of humility. <laughs> like, I think when you're getting started, like you could fast forward a century later, it's pretty much the same story in terms of the apprehension sure. and reticence that people have in terms of whether or not there's, you know, an opportunity here or something that can really be built. And I, I was originally, before starting Terra Cafe, I was originally working in electric vehicles in Germany. So that was for that period of my life, um, living abroad in, in Berlin and was I a lot of times honestly chalk it up to just the the quality of the individuals I was surrounded by uh, in terms of just that beautiful balance of left brain and right brain. So there was just this um, amazing network of creatives, engineers, designers. And I think that that's something that I, I definitely appreciated from a, uh, from uh, an opportunity of getting to work with them. But I also, again, like kind of draw that through line back to my parents, both being architects, you know, I wasn't allowed to basically walk into any new space or building without recognizing every little detail from, you know, the wood grain of the, the mm. um, you know, the floor to the baseboards, to the sconces, what have you, like you needed to pay attention to everything. And I'd be like, mom, can we just go into the lobby, please? And she's like, no, you got to stop. You got to pay attention. Like wow. you see it creates momentum. And I'm like, I, I, I always appreciated that attitude, but I think that um, as I got older, got to Berlin, got surrounded by these people that had all almost, it felt like everybody had that same level of attention to detail. Um, it, it, that's where it kind of just went, kind of went crazy because for me, it was such an Im important formative moment in me building up the skill set that I would eventually need to start Terra Cafe. I think having a business background, a background in, in operations, familiar, familiarity with manufacturing, with uh, production, supply chain, as you can imagine, that really pays dividends these days. But that was a huge part of my kind of more formal background or academic background. But bundling into all of that, the design sensibilities, philosophies, to, to care about it and understand what it does to people in terms of enhancing their day-to-day -day lives and experiences, that would be where I would say, you know, when you talk about like, what does that travel do for you? What does that experience do for you? It's a story of people and the people you meet along the way. And you have to open yourself to those types of opportunities. You have to open yourself up to those kind of experiences. And it's kind of intimidating. Like I remember that flight when I left, you know, the US to go live in Berlin. I remember the only time it really hit me that it was kind of weird was when I was like, oh, we're landing, you know, the you know, pilot starts telling you you're descending into the you know, airport. I was like, oh, there's no return flight here. Like, I'm, there's no ticket back. I'm, I'm, this, is, this is the new home. And I think that was the only moment that kind of caught me on my heels. But from then on, it was just like embracing all the experiences, learning from people. Frankly, again, like back to the humility note, like listening, learning from people that just have these incredible stories and skills. And using that as my springboard into starting something new. And we really felt like at the time, me and my friends were like, we could kind of build almost anything. And I know it comes off bombastic, but we're like, we have, we have the right kind of energy and, you know, let's call it like, quote unquote, like portfolio of skills or resumes to, to do it. And it was really just a matter of like, what are we passionate about? Where do we see an opportunity? Like, what do we want to jump into? And being okay with us giving us giving uh, giving it our best shot, being okay with you know whatever the outcome is, like just accepting that uh, you know you give something your best go, and uh, you'll see how it turns out. I think was a big part of accepting the nerves and the jitters that come with starting something new. You're not going to have everything solved. You just have to have good people around you. It does take a village, and um, you know having fun. Did you have a passion particularly for green tech or was it really just whatever, wherever the wind is blowing, 
I'm just going to look for an opportunity and go with it. It's definitely both. It's like, I, I still remember like my environmental AP environmental sciences class when I was in high school was unequivocally my favorite class. Um, it was like, it, it honestly caught me by surprise. <laughs> uh, it, it was one of those things where it was more emotionally and viscerally important to me than I realized it would be. And that was just obviously the first exposure to really understanding it. But yes, it is absolutely bundled with opportunity. You're, you, you hear, you know, you hear of different things that are happening in the zeitgeist of how people want to look for other solutions and how, you know, our economy or how kind of the, 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 the overall market can facilitate that. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's actually saying that like, okay, like there is demand for this because people care. That's ultimately what it boils down to. So when people care, when people are looking for alternatives, that also creates opportunity. And so I think that that to me was like, one of the things I always found the most confounding was people being like, oh, it's a burden that you're taking on to be more sustainable. When in reality, it can actually solve a lot of problems and quell a lot of issues that you're having is if you're actually just taking into account all of those externalities and actually pricing them in, you're actually realizing that the sustainable solutions are far more favorable both to yourself and to society. At what point did you decide that coffee was the ticket? Yeah, I think that that's one of the one of the first things I always try and, you know, share with other people that are I'm talking with that are thinking about starting companies like you're never going to you're never going to be at a point where your idea is bulletproof and that's totally fine. And you're going to have to be iterating a lot and be comfortable with iterating when you transfer something from an idea to execution. It's just it's going to happen and just to have peace and comfort with that. Um when I was working in electric vehicles, I definitely was looking at other hardware categories or things that I felt all of a sudden to me were very, uh, I like to use the word like demystified. It was very easy to understand, like you can break things apart and actually very quickly understand, even if you don't have a mechanical engineering degree, how they all kind of function um, and, and, and kind of work as a system. And for me, again, like I kind of put that passion side always into the equation because it was just a regular part of my daily rituals that as a consumable which we can call it that yes there's a kind of like fuel component to it but there's a very artisanal side to it as well and i love both of them i i i i, I think it's equal parts both and so it was all of that coming together and then as as part of like my just you know daily course of life was looking for a new machine and i found it really interesting that when you were looking for an option for a home espresso machine or a home coffee solution, and you didn't want to resort to coffee capsules or pods, there weren't, you think of coffee, you think there are a million options. There weren't that many. Hmm. There just weren't. And then I remember I just was intrigued by this. And we start. I, I, I want to just start running surveys and seeing how many people could actually name espresso machine brands outside of the kind of big bad wolf in our category of Nespresso. And we're like, let's just see, like, let's just ask people who they're familiar with. And at that time, kind of 2017, you know, it was, it was shocking. It was shocking how few people could actually name another brand in the space. And although to your point at the beginning, there are a lot of legacy brands that are still around, you know, centuries old companies that are around that have been active in the coffee space and specifically in coffee hardware. But when it came to people that, were adapting to modern demands it was shockingly slim mm. you're talking about a, a, a category that you would think has like five thousand brands really basically had four or five and to me the four or five players in that space although we don't want to ever kind of denigrate someone's legacy or use derisive language towards that i think it's really important to note that the technology the quality the, the, the kind of communication and distribution strategies they were implementing just did not make any sense for a contemporary consumer. And we're, this is to me where I was like, is this opportunity as big as I think it is? Because then you always have the doubts, right? You have the little voices. Right. In your head How could like, it be? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so... Surely they're working on it. Exactly. And yeah. you can only imagine the questions that you subsequently get from investors too because they have the same reservations and they pause and think, hey, like, I mean... If it, if it could have been done, it would have been done. Or if there was an opportunity, it would have been done. Yeah. The reality of it was that, you know, when you don't have that many brands and you have a very complex hardware product, I mean, you have, you know, 
<laughs> you have food science, you have thermal engineering, you have pneumatic engineering. It's incredibly complex device. Um, and a kind of few seated incumbents, you actually weren't seeing any innovation in the space because they didn't need to innovate. Hmm. They had a really nice cushy position. And I, I, I understand there's all sorts of, you know, management consulting books, you know, uh, that love to use different kind of nomenclature and jargon around, you know, the, the sleeping con sleepy incumbent, but, um, that kind of technical inertia in that direction, I think also opens up a lot of opportunity. And so that was from like very grassroots research, um, which was as low fidelity and unglamorous as just knocking on doors in Soho when I got back to the US and wanted to start serving coffee to local New York crowds um, as, you know, just going there and serving thousands of cups of coffee every weekend, morning, weekday, morning that I could um, to learn from consumers and see what they like, what they don't like, what they know and what they don't know. And that was the start of it. What vehicle did you use for that? Did you pop up a corner shop or how did, where did you serve them? I, it, it's as bootstrapped as it can get. I did you have a cart? didn't even have the money to buy a dolly for the devices. I literally got the biggest Ikea bag I could find okay. and I would have two prototypes on my shoulders and I would go door to door and so, cause I heard that that's the cool area of New York. I never lived in New York, so I didn't know much about it. Um, and knocked on doors and I said, okay, like I'll knock on a hundred doors and of the, what are the quote unquote cool shops, I suppose. And we'll see if somebody will let me serve a coffee there over the weekend. Uh, that was how it got started. Like you knock on a hundred doors, eventually somebody says yes. And we learned just from the very first event, um, we learned so much from just people trying out the machine. And I think that we always tried to put a very polished foot forward, but those early days was very much, you know, I joke that it's the um, kind of pursuit of happiness in reverse. You know, I was working at, originally in finance and then ended up on the subway schlepping machines. And I was like, all right, I think that's totally fine. I think that there's something here because every time I served a coffee, every time I entered into a dialogue with somebody, you would learn a little bit more about how there was a demand here. And I felt like that was the validation that I was looking for to understand that the thesis was correct, that they didn't really have an option to graduate to or away from the pod-based system. So giving a more sustainable solution that was actually over time a more affordable one and aesthetically and from a quality perspective, a better solution, better option was kind of like a no brainer. And then it was just a matter of, again, like chipping away at it, like keep trying to grow the business every day in whatever means I, I could with the resources I had. Did you uh, charge people for this or were you just giving away these cups of coffee? Giving it away. Had to. Nice. Had to. And so then I would try and engender some try goodwill. What's that? That must have engendered some goodwill. A free cup of coffee goes a long way on a cold day. Totally. Totally. I know anybody who gives me a free cup of coffee just went up 10 points in my esteem. It's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, especially yeah. when it's cold outside, which tends to happen occasionally in New York. Um, uh, but yeah, it's okay. So it's funny you mentioned that because my first experience, I drink coffee every day. I'm an addict, but I drink it from a French press. I go very old school because I don't like Miss Bence's invention. I don't like filtering out the oils and the, I, yeah. I prefer French press to the paper coffee filtered coffee. But when I first went to Europe, there was this thing. Have you heard of a Senseo device? That was all yeah. the rage. It swept the nation, right? So Senseo, we got one of these secondhand. I hated that thing because I always thought of it as water flavored with coffee hint. It was not coffee. And I drank that until I basically threw that machine away in disgust because I hated it so much. And then came the Nespresso and the Keurig and all those things, which, which are okay. But I, I, I never liked any of them for what they do better than I just like a regular old French press. So my yeah. life has remained very low tech because none of them were really good enough. And I've seen in Europe now they have devices that they do have the beans built in something sort of similar to what you've, you, you have, I guess. But I have yet to try one of those or a powdered version that was truly good, in my opinion. So I just stick with the easy thing. Um, do you feel that you've raised the bar in terms of the quality of coffee that's coming out compared to whatever else there is? Yeah, I think that 
that's definitely one of the biggest areas when we were you know just doing teardowns of whoever was in the space to understand what was out there one of the biggest areas where we saw an opportunity was that it almost felt like there was a blatant disregard for trying to improve the overall coffee quality or especially espresso quality um and there was this kind of tacit approval that everyone else is doing it the same way so you know clearly it's accepted i think it goes back to the whole you know sometimes it takes uh you know a challenger brand to come in to really question whether or not you know that that has to be the way that it is or like essentially it boils down to there being a better way to improve that experience for people and so for me it was it was definitely a focus because i think that the overall bar was being raised out of home so if you talk about for example even within the us the experiences that people were having kind of almost graduating away from the second wave of coffee to the third wave getting more artisanal learning about specialty grade coffee people were getting more and more accustomed to a higher caliber kind of brew so to speak and so it was a question of how do you actually bring that experience home how do you mm. get what you're getting now more and more accustomed to which was also more espresso based beverages we saw in 2017 the latte surpassed drip coffee as the most ordered drink in the US that continues to climb as much as people love to hate on Starbucks you got to give them a little bit of credit got to pay a little bit of reverence to the giant in the category they popularized that you know espresso based beverage or ebb category over 2 3 decades right so um that's where we saw a shift from people graduating away from that out of home but nothing was changing in the in home solutions and so that's where we wanted to come in better better you know encouraging better coffee quality better precision in the machine better consistency and that's especially something that we've really focused on with our new machine that we just released the the TK2 um building in a lot of proprietary technology that makes that entire experience just like a commercial grade barista pulling a shot at your favorite cafe. First of all, I guess I should say congratulations on the launch of your new machine. It looks sweet. I got the press kit last night and I looked it over. It looks great. Um looks super cool. Uh, of course, you've raised a significant amount of funding or at least what I think is a significant amount of funding. Um So what do you think the biggest draw has been now that you've launched like you said previously we we're waiting on this day it's happened now um what has been the biggest draw now that you're here what are people responding to the most out of all these different things that they could be interested in including <laughs> investors Yeah I mean I think on the the new machine there's what I love about the the new machine that you know we've been seeing the reception um it's just been overwhelmingly positive and it's been awesome to see um but one of the things i really love that we did was we took learnings from another product that was in you know in people's homes for you know 3 plus years into all of our product development r&d decisions into the new product so in the tk2 we weren't really guessing what people wanted to see we were really clear on what mattered to them to the most and for some people that was you know something as simple as a bigger water tank for example or making sure that the machine could handle a wider range of versatility of bean types so whether you like you know super light roasted single origin or you know incredibly dark sumatran beans it doesn't matter like you you can pretty much put everything through the machine and it can get exactly you know be dialed in exactly to the way that you like it and that kind of brought us to the precision part where um the biggest issue with these machines was that they were incredibly variable in how the experience would work from day to day and from bean to bean and so we wanted to build in a lot of smart features that automate that process so that everything is as consistent as possible from shot to shot so shot day 1 to shot you know year 2 this is year 10 what what have you is the same but also adding a lot more functionality for the user to be able to tweak and toggle if they want to. So it kind of bifurcated these two worlds where it's like if you just want to hit a button and you want to make sure it's the same every time and that's all you want, beautiful, it's there for you. Simple. Yeah. If you want to go deep down the rabbit hole, you know, you can absolutely do so and every every kind of variable that a barista would dial in, you can do the same. And then of course from a design perspective, you know, we wanted to double down on that contemporary design. We felt like that was kind of lacking so why we even um called the project you know for the development project brucke which in german means bridge and we wanted to bridge that 
Europe to U- US, we wanted to bridge that old to new. So, you know, I was working in, uh, you know, a category where we are basically electrifying Vespas. And, and now I'm working in a category where we're modernizing what it means to bring the espresso home and, and being able to offer that experience for people was, I, I think, really exciting because people are so like, oh my God, it's like the first thing I'm actually excited to have on my countertop. You got to earn that real estate in the kitchen, you know, both like the temporal and physical real estate that you occupy in someone's home with this product is incredibly important. And we recognize that. And that was, that was something that I wanted the whole team to really understand from the beginning of the project was we are a big part of people's morning ritual. And we are often a very communal device that's used across the entire household. So we need to respect that space that we're taking up and we need to make sure we're delivering a lot of value. And that can be from the moment you just see the device and feeling good about it. Um, and it obviously goes through the entire journey of using the device every morning. And is even why we ended up deciding to build a, a, a hybrid brew unit, which can switch between any espresso based beverage or EBB, which you've now learned. I know. Now I know that. Yeah. yeah. And so it can do true drip, which is, you know, one of those things that we felt was missing in the category of what are super automatic espresso machines that, you know, they often say that they can do that, but they're essentially just extracting an espresso for much longer. We wanted to design something that could get you that true, you know, pour over or even French press mouthfeel um, so that, you know, we can really serve the entire household with one device. But it's nice that the confluence of all of the factors of your life came together for this and that you're still using those different cultural influences. It's cool. It's always fascinating to me. I mean, it's that Steve Jobs quote, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. I'm sure you must feel a little bit of that each week when you think of all of the different influences that shape where you're at right now. Totally. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's eclectic to say the least. It is random at its most honest, <laughs> uh, but it's, 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 I guess I should be careful with saying random because it's, it all kind of amounts to like a tapestry or a mosaic that makes so much sense for what I'm doing right now. And that's, you know, exactly to that quote, but I think that is, kind of looking at all of the skills and experiences that arm you with different abilities at a moment in time. And then that's kind of where I go back to that. Like there are all sorts of things that I think people want to do. And I think people have way more ideas than they realize. Oftentimes people tell me they want to start something and they're like, I just don't you know, have the perfect idea yet. Or I don't know what it's, it's like, you kind of like, I, I think a lot of people have a million ideas. They don't realize it. it's just like even having like a pain point or a paper cut in some experience, like that's an idea right there. Like that's something to try and solve. But, um, you know, having the experiences that amount to being able to execute on that, I think adding those all up, you know, it, it really makes it clear to me, you know, how a narrative or a kind of an arc kind of was formed here because it was the living in China. It was even working in banking for a short stint. It was, um, you know, being the son of two architects, it was trying to start a wind farm in the Midwest. It was, you know, going to Germany, like they, they all came together. And I think that like, kind of like, I don't know, weird mixed bag of experiences made for a very clear story into starting Terra Cafe. But I, um, if you had asked me right beforehand, I would have been like, I don't know. I probably was the guy who was just picking, it looked like I was just picking random cards from a deck and being like, all right, sure. Why not? Like, let's go to, you know. France next. Why not? (laughs) I know we're running short on time here, so I'd like to give you the last word. If there's a parting piece of wisdom or if there's just something you want to promote, you want to direct people to buy the new TKO2, whatever you like, floor is yours. Yeah, I I, absolutely. I want to end with um, one thanking you for for this time to to chat with you and share a little bit about my story. Um, And then two, of course, promoting our our new product. I feel... um, Athlete that I should have number two be our TKO2. So um, you can check it out on our website, uh, terracafe.com, and um, you know see what that's all about. There's a you know Put all sorts of bells and whistles that I wasn't able to get to there, but you know there's a lot of amazing things that we're sharing there. And um, yeah, I uh, just uh, you know excited for for all the other founders and entrepreneurs out there that are taking the road less traveled, um, beating, beating the often path and, hey, um, you got the yeah, plug sending, sending more, you know, all the power, you know, kind of good energy out there to everyone, because as somebody who's been through this slog, I know that it's, it's not easy. And, um, 
you know, can often be even a somewhat lonely path, if I can say that. But, um, you know, it's definitely worth it. And it it opens up so many different and new and interesting avenues that you wouldn't otherwise get. So as somebody who's deeply appreciative of taking that path, um, I can only encourage it for everyone else. Well, that's a fabulous way to wrap it up. And thank you, San, for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Check it out, everybody, terracafe.com. And with that, the podcast is over. 